it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce uh, 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 Jane Dirk. And Jane uh, was a uh, medical student uh, at uh, Baylor. Um, she was uh, an ophthalmology resident uh, at the University of Utah uh, back before the Moran Eye Center was the Moran Eye Center. Um, she has uh, uh, done a neuro-ophthalmology fellowship at the University of Iowa. She did three different glaucoma fellowships, one with Alan Crandall at the U, uh, one um, in uh, London, at Moorfields, and then one um, in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and um, then we were lucky enough to have her on our faculty during the 90s uh, before she and John decided to, to go to Spokane and um, uh, spent a, a lot of their career there, but then moved back to Salt Lake City and uh, we're lucky to have her as a neighbor uh, collaborator and a mentor for some of our, our, our folks uh, uh, since that time. Um, and uh, uh, she is our uh, distinguished uh, alumni uh, uh, person of the year uh, um, for the Moran Eye Center in the Department of Ophthalmology. Uh, and she's also my uh, uh, good friend and I'm absolutely thrilled to hear what she has to say. Uh, uh, Jane, you're on. Oh, thank you, Bob, for that lovely introduction. Let me just hope, hope, hope that I can manage to do this. You're there. Okay. Okay, I think I've got it. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you all so much for the invitation to speak here today. Um, like I said, I'm really sad this is a virtual event. I was hoping to meet a lot of you. Please, please come up and introduce yourselves when I next have the pleasure of attending a live Graham Rounds. Um, I have to admit that when Jeff Petty first called me to let me know about this award. I was so honored and grateful, but more than a little bit anxious about what I could possibly talk to you all about. And so I pulled up my old CV and started looking at reprints. And one of the things I considered and thought about was eye syndromes. I had reported on this really great case of Kogan Reese many years ago. So I thought, well, that's a consideration. And then I thought about a paper I'd written on same site revision of failing filters. And I had great photos of encapsulated blebs and occluded fistulas, tight scleral flaps, episcleral membranes. And, um, and I thought, well, you know, this is, this is a real possibility. And then I also considered lens-induced glaucoma. I had written a book chapter and uh, I've always been really interested in the subject. And yet the more I thought about all of these, I thought, honestly, you have really great attendings who are totally up to date in all areas of ophthalmology. And, um, you know, I, I haven't practiced full time for several years, and I should really try to find a subject that you might not hear from your current attendings. And then I remembered that when Jeff Petty introduced me at the Academy Alumni event in New Orleans, he mentioned that I was in the running for the most fellowships ever. And I realized that I have had a, a lot of really great mentors and um, probably more than most. And then that was reinforced uh, when I was, I was looking through this book that the, the chapter on lens induced glaucoma is in. And I saw this foreword from one of my mentors, Mike Van Buskirk, and I just like to read a small quote from, from the foreword. From their roots in the ancient world, physicians have always been called upon both to heal and to teach, the latter perhaps the more sacred of the duties. Healing helps one at a time, but the passing of the knowledge reaches millions for generations to come. Teachers of medicine can feel no greater joy than when their own students embark on a project of sharing their knowledge. And like I said, it, it just re-emphasized to me the importance of mentors in our lives. And so I elected to discuss, um, discuss mentorship and um, some of the lessons that I learned from my mentors. And I'll come back to the other two subjects that I mentioned earlier, but from the standpoint of, of mentorship. So... Um, what I'd like to do is just start a little bit with a brief history of mentorship. 
and then talk about how I arranged or more commonly fell into fellowships. And then it's come to my attention that some of the great leaders in ophthalmology either retire or pass away. And sometimes the next generation is really unaware of their contributions. So I would like to just take a few minutes to honor my mentors by telling you just a little about them. And then I learned, of course, a lot of science from them, but what I really wanna talk about are the other lessons, the life lessons I learned or the mentoring lessons that I learned from these people. Now, not all of the situations, mentorship situations I found myself in were perfect, but universally there were silver linings. And I'd look, like to look at this both from my view as a, my experience as a mentee and as a mentor. So to start out with, I think most of us are aware in general what mentorship is. It's the relationship between two people where the individual with more experience, knowledge and connections is able to pass along what they have learned to a more junior individual within a certain field. And there are benefits to both sides in this equation. The mentor can lead future generations in a field that they care deeply about. And the mentee can receive the help that they need to make the next step in their careers. Now, um, mentor is a character uh, mentioned in Homer's Odyssey. And when Odysseus leaves to fight in the Trojan War, Odysseus, he entrusts his young son Telemachus into the care of mentor, his trusted companion. Now, there are many, many examples of mentorship throughout histories, particularly in various religious disciplines, the medieval guild system. But it's not really until the 1990s that mentorship is popularized in the United States as a, as a term and a, and a tool. And I personally suspect this has something to do with increasing diversity in the workforce and those looking to try to climb the ladder in their careers, looking for some, some help in that regard. So I've included this photograph which is one of my favorites from the Pacific Coast Odo Ophthalmologic Society, which was a, actually a fairly large gathering at the time um, of otolaryngologists and ophthalmologists. And this happened to be in Spokane, Washington in 1917. And it's a little bit blurry, but you can see easily see that all the members were white men. Now, when I left, um, <clears throat> excuse me, when I sadly left Moran in 2001 and joined the Spokane Eye Clinic in private practice, at that time, about 100% of the physicians were men and 99% of the staff were women. <clears throat> Excuse me, my throat's dry. Anyway, um, I will never forget my first day in the operating room. I was handed a pair of flowered scrubs from the nurse's station and Went into the OR where there were new instruments, new FACO units, new assistants, and I felt really incredible stress and pressure not to fail to show this staff of women that a woman could actually do this work. Now, the, the point of this story is, is it can be really, really nice to have mentors that look or sound like you, but your mentor does not have to come from the same background. All of my mentors are men. So what is really necessary? And um, what I would like to submit to you is that what you're really looking for in a mentor is someone who wants to share relevant information and expertise, who's not afraid of the mentee excelling, who displays positivity and enthusiasm for the field, gives honest and constructive feedback, has extensive experience in the relative field, and is credible and trustworthy. Anything else is really icing. So I'd like to just take you on my own personal journey into postgraduate education. And I've included this photograph from the ophthalmology department in 1986. And you can see it's quite a bit, sm bit smaller than it is today. We had um, six residents. I think you could see Mike Teske there in the first row, who was my co-resident. Um, two interns, about six faculty, but what we didn't have was a neuro-ophthalmologist. Now, I had decided to pursue a career in glaucoma, and Alan Crandall had agreed to take me as his first fellow. And then, sometime that year, I was summoned to see Randy Olson. 
Now, I know the, I'm not the only one in the department who's had such a summons. I know for a fact that Jeff Petty had a similar conversation, and I s suspect there have been many others. But anyway, Randy sat me down and he said, you know, we need a neuro-ophthalmologist. And I've spoken to the people at Iowa, and they will take you, and you only have to go for six months, and then you can uh, come back and be our neuro-ophthalmologist, but you can still spend six months with Alan, but you'll be, you know, you'll be working neuro-ophthalmologist. So after thinking about this for a while, realizing that I, I really had a lot to gain and not much to lose, uh, and figuring out where Iowa was, I packed my bags, uh, drove to Iowa City, where I met these two men, uh, Stan Thompson and Jim Corbett. Now, Stan was an extraordinary man, the uh, son of English missionaries in China. He was the founder and director of the Neuro-Ophthalmology Division at Iowa. And he, you can see from this photograph where there are five of us, um, five of us fellows, and you should recognize the one at the end, your own Kathleen Degree. They trained and influenced numerous residents and fellows and had a hu huge impact on the field of neuro-ophthalmology. The incredible thing about the six months was taking an hour every day to review every on-call patient from the night before with the whole ophthalmology department, and then another hour to discuss each neuro patient from the day before. And it was really such a, a great intellectual pleasure. Stan ran the, uh, the department for 30 years and the, the clinic is now named for him. Uh, Stan was affectionately known as Mr. Pupil. Uh, there really, I don't believe, was much of anything he didn't know about pupils. And I've included this uh, flow chart to sort, sorting out the anisocorias that he published in 1976. Uh, you've probably seen this many times, reproduced, extended, expanded upon. Um, but it's really a, uh, a mark of his intellect that he was able to distill something so complicated to make it relatively easy to evaluate. This was the first time I'd ever known that you could ever measure a relative afferent pupil defect. I thought they came in you know, one to four plus, and I certainly never looked uh, at, at an iris so in depth. Now, Stan was also a master clinician. He was especially good in dealing with functional and difficult patients, which uh, unfortunately there were a fair number in the neuro clinic. I've included this paper of his from 95 on functional visual loss. He had so many great tricks for just determining that there was no actual organic disease, which of course is key in the evaluation. And I'm also so grateful to him for exposing me to this paper by Groves. It's about taking care of the hateful patient, which is really dealing with manipulative, demanding, uh, dependent patients. And I, I referred back to this paper so many times in my career. I just wanted to share it with you. One of the other things I'm really, really grateful for was this corn party that he hosted every year. And at the beginning of the year, he would invite the whole department to his farm just outside of Iowa City, and he would pick corn and cook it up in huge cauldrons, and everyone would bring side dishes to share. And it was such a wonderful way to be welcomed to the ophthalmology department and to be made uh, to feel part of the ophthalmology family. And the other thing I learned from him was the importance of decompressing at the end of the day. Now, Stan kept a bottle of sherry in his desk drawer. And at the end of a particularly tough day, we'd retire to his office and have a few sips of sherry and discuss whatever had been going on. And I tried to carry on that tradition Fortunately for Randy, not with Sherry, but um, I did try to keep a box of chocolates or cookies or something. And it's something I tried to continue really throughout my career was just to take five minutes with the staff at the end of the day to just decompress before everybody headed out into their otherwise very busy lives. Jim Corbett was also a great intellect. He was a world expert on idiopathic intracranial hypertension. And it's because of him and uh, Stan Thompson that I learned so, so much about optic neuropathies that I felt I had a, a really good basic knowledge to handle tough optic nerve cases, like this particular patient that was sent to me for a trabeculectomy. 
Fortunately, I knew enough to realize that a trab was really not going to help this brain tumor very much. Now, this is a pretty cut and dried case. Uh, the visual field kind of gave it away. But there were, were many uh, much more subtle cases like other pseudoglaucomas or glaucomas plus other diseases, plus hydrocephalus or any other number of um, optic neuropathies. So I was, I was forever grateful for them uh, giving me this training. Now, the silver lining for living in a basement apartment in Iowa City for six months was that I had an amazing foundation for a career, academic career in glaucoma. I learned the joy of, of daily in-depth discussions. And maybe the best thing about that was that the basement apartment was right next door to Kathleen Degree. And it was really the start of a really lifelong friendship and collaboration, particularly uh, on many projects designed to get us to Arvo in Sarasota every year. So following this six months in Iowa, I went back to Salt Lake City um, to become what felt like the only neuro-ophthalmologist in the Western United States. I did not get a lot of time to do glaucoma with Alan, but I did thankfully get um, some time in the operating room with him, which was of huge importance. So about two and a half years later, when my husband finished his residency, I thought, you know, I really need some more glaucoma training. And I had been born in England, I had family there. And so we thought, well, this is a good time to go to England and I can get some additional training in glaucoma there. So I um, did, did a little research and found that Roger Hitchings was a very, very prominent glaucomatologist in England. And so um, he had a, a wide, wide range of contributions to the field. And I, uh, about a year before, I sent him a letter with my CV and asked whether he'd be willing to take me as a fellow. And I got a lovely letter back from him saying, yes, he'd be delighted to have me. So um, in 19, summer of 1989, we arrived in England and I showed up at the Moorfields Eye Clinic. And uh, to my surprise, found that there were conservatively at least 12 other fellows from all over the world. And I could barely see the slit lamp, let alone see what Roger Hitchings was looking at. So I'm a fairly visual learner, and uh, I thought after a little while of this, I thought this really is not going to work very well for me. So I started to look around, and I was introduced to Noel Rice. Now, Noel Rice was a really, really wonderful man. This photograph was of him was taken many years before I met him. He was a pioneer in microsurgery. He specialized in congenital glaucoma and established that service at Moorfields Eye Hospital. He held a congenital glaucoma clinic once a week, and I learned uh, so much about how to take care of this special group of patients and their families. He was a pioneer in anti-scarring treatment well before mitomycin or 5-FU. He was using beta radiation as an anti-scarring method. He also had a huge interest in external disease, and because of that, I had access to the external disease clinic at Moorfields, which was absolutely full of incredible pathology. I saw so many interesting things. So besides learning about congenital glaucoma, uh, one of the things that I learned, which probably should have been obvious to me, but wasn't at the time, and that is that it's really, really smart to make personal contact with other fellows before engaging, uh, embarking on a fellowship. However, if you find yourself in a situation where a mentor is not meeting your educational goals or needs, by all means, don't be afraid to change and find a mentor that does. Uh, there were many silver linings. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the pathology walking through Moorfields Eye Hospital every day was really extraordinary. There were the obvious pleasures of living in London, traveling, and reconnecting with my extended family. And then at the end of that year, we headed off to Portland, Oregon, where my husband had um, was going to be doing a fellowship in facial plastics, a second year. 
And at this point, I was six and a half months pregnant. And so we arrived in Portland and I was planning to, you know, unpack. And I did that. I unpacked in a couple of days. And then I looked around and I didn't know anybody and didn't have anything to do. And I thought, I can't possibly sit around waiting for this baby to arrive for another two and a half, three months. And so I started to wonder if there might be somebody willing to let me look over their shoulder for a while just to learn whatever I could. And so I did a little bit of research and read about Mike Van Buskirk. I called Alan Crandall. He gave me the thumbs up. And so I called and made an appointment with him. Now, Mike Van Buskirk was a really, really, uh, really accomplished man. Uh, he had his undergrad and medical degrees from Harvard, fellowship at Mass Dineer with Morton Grant. He, he established the glaucoma service at OHSU, and then he uh, left in 1990, which is when I met him, to become chief of ophthalmology at Devers Eye Institute. He was a founding editor of the Journal of Glaucoma. He was a founding member of the American Glaucoma Society and president of that society. He retired in 2004 and continued to teach for a while, but then also um, expanded his other interests and has written several nonfiction books and has really had a whole second career in uh, photography. Um, so I made this appointment with him and um, sat down and just explained my situation and asked if I could, if he would mind if I maybe followed him around in clinic from time to time, just to learn anything he might have to teach. And he sat back and said, well, you know, let me think about this. And then the next day he called me and said, how would you like to be my fellow for the next year? And of course that was more than I had even dreamt of, uh, but then I had to remind him that, you know, I was pregnant and uh, he said, well, what would a, a good schedule for you be? And so my thought was nothing ventured, nothing gained. So I told him, well, ideally I'd like to work full time until the baby's born. And then I'd like to take a little time off and then I'd like to come back part time. And Amazingly, he agreed. Now, Mike has written hundreds of papers, original articles, books, book chapters, but one I really want to mention to you is his Clinical Atlas of Glaucomas, which is one of my all-time favorite books in ophthalmology. It is absolutely full of wonderful images, particularly of the secondary glaucomas. And I use this book over and over again, teaching medical students and first year residents. And I'm, I'm pretty sure there's a copy of this um, in the library. I think Alan's copy is in, in the Moran library. Now he had so many contributions to the field that I couldn't even begin to start telling you about them all. But one thing I do wanna mention is that he developed this technique for imaging ocular blood vessels. And what he did was cannulate fine vessels in autopsy eyes with plastic tubes, and then injected methacrylate into the lumens, removed the tissue, and then uh, did scanning electron microscopy. And you can see here in the upper picture, you can see the vasculature of the optic nerve and inferiorly of the ciliary body. And he contributed enormously to our understanding of ocular blood flow. So besides the incredible science and clinical medicine I learned from him, I once again learned the importance of making a stranger welcome in your community, the importance of family. He and his really lovely wife, Betty, welcomed me into their family. Um, they included me in family celebrations. She gave me my first Mother's Day present. And it was so important for someone um, dropped into a city knowing absolutely no one to feel, to feel welcomed. He also taught me the importance of forming a great team and appreciating and respecting their work. And this photogra photograph shows um, his long-term uh, ophthalmic technician, Joanne, and his administrative assistant, Suzanne. 
Now, uh, Mike Van Boskert was an unbelievable scientist, clinician, educator, administrator, but he could not about have done this without his team. And, um, and he says, I think he says it best with his own words. And this is a, a note that he sent to Joanne when she received an award. And he said, you have done so much for me personally, managing my practice, moving with me to Good Samaritan, helping me in surgery and a myriad of little things without which I could not have accomplished what I was able to manage in my career. And uh, it was a, a really, really important lesson to me. Now, uh, this is, I'm coming back to the, the article I mentioned about same site revision of failed filtering gloves. Uh, this was some research that I did with Mike Van Baskirk. And I had the honor of publishing the first article in the first volume of the Journal of Glaucoma. Apparently it helps to have the editor as one of your co-authors. And then he invited me to speak at a meeting in Portland just several years later uh, about the same subject. And at the end of the meeting, he pulled me aside and said, I think it's time for you to start teaching this part of my trabeculectomy course at the academy. And he basically passed the baton at that point. He invited Jack Choppy, who was his fellow after me, to run, uh, run the course and included Culder Singh, Jeff Liebman, Bob Fechner. And I had the honor of um, talking about failing filters. I became known as the, the queen of failing filters. But um, this course, uh, went on for years and years and years. I was involved for about 17 years, but it is, I believe, ongoing with some additions and some people changing out. Uh, he also was really uh, prominent in promoting my career in including me in AGAS committees. And I know that um, my involvement in Glaucoma Day lectures stemmed from him. And I just I, I wanna make a little comment to Abigail about your talk earlier. Um, I happen to know that at the time I was invited to my first glaucoma day lecture, uh, there had been a number of comments from, the, uh, from people who had attended the glaucoma day the year before, commenting on the fact that the entire uh, speaking committee was all uh, all men, and that there were no uh, no women speaking. And I I believe that uh, I was actually the beneficiary of some reverse discrimination in that they read those reviews and actually tried very hard to start including women uh, in the speak uh, as speakers in, at at big meetings. So. I was really, really fortunate to have found someone who was really uh, just unstinting in his promotion of my career. So the silver linings to this year were that I finally felt like I had a full glaucoma fellowship. I had patched between some time with Alan and some time in London and some time with Mike Van Buskirk. Uh, I felt like I was actually trained in glaucoma. And thankfully, Randy Olson agreed and invited me to come back and join the faculty, this time as a glaucoma specialist. I also uh, made some really incredible lifelong friendships there. Of course, there's no um, silver linings without clouds. And um, the, the only really downside to this year was that I got minimal surgical experience. Now we all know that glaucoma surgery is an art and watching is not the same thing as doing. And so that uh, lack of experience made for a really difficult year as a first year glaucoma attending. Now, the point being that this is yet another thing that you should talk to uh, prior fellows about before embarking on a fellowship. Now, of course, for me, any experience at that point was better than having no experience for a year. And I was incredibly lucky to have had personal surgical time, both as a resident and as a fellow with Alan Crandall. But uh, once again, it was, a, it was a, a very difficult transition for me. 
Now, I'd also like to talk about learning from mentees. I learned from every resident and particularly the fellows. They all brought new perspectives from their prior institutions. Uh, Norm Zabriski, who became a, a good friend and colleague, I learned from for many years as we shared difficult patients. I'll never forget the fellow who, in the middle of a case, handed me a trabeculectomy flap with a pair of forceps. And together we learned how to fix that problem. And then, of course, there's Ike Ahmed. And uh, I am still learning from Ike, uh, as is the rest of the world, about innovative glaucoma procedures. And I am so thrilled to see him as the director of the Alan S. Crandall Center for Glaucoma Innovation. Congratulations to Ike. Now I wanna go back to the case of Kogan Reese that I mentioned at the start and talk about it in light of what I learned about mentoring medical students. Um, I wanted to include this case uh, partially because I just can't pass up the opportunity to share it. But like I said, I, I, it's also about what I learned about mentoring students. So you can see here in this first picture, um, this was, I think, from 1992, that there is abnormality of the iris superiorly and temporally, some ectropian uvea, and so-called iris nevi, and then there's a higher uh, power view. And I'd like to give a shout out to Paula Morris, a photographer at Moran, who did these great images. And then these images are from about five years later, and you can see a lot more ectropian Propionuvia, and then the abnormal iris architecture has extended for 360 degrees and, and includes the inferior iris at this point. And we were also lucky to have had a, a sample of iris obtained at the time of a prior trabeculectomy in Nick Mamelis and his group did the um, histopathology for me on this. And you can see here, particularly on the on the right, the abnormal basement membrane-like tissue on the surface of the iris with pigmented iris protrusions through the fenestra in the membrane. But what I really, uh, what is really special to me about this paper is highlighted at the bottom right. And that is that the first author is a medical student. Now I was involved in um, some medical student summer research projects for about five years. The project I was doing was a long-term ongoing genetics research. And they did a lot of the Scott work, tracking down families, blood collection, other genetic material collection. But I knew that they would never get a paper out of that project. And so I tried to find a small limited project for the students that they could get published in the limited time they have. And um, when I went back and looked at the students that I'd worked with, it turned out that every single one of them, uh, but one, uh, was accepted into an ophthalmology residency program. And the one that didn't, we unfortunately lost to dermatology. So it's sometimes hard to write papers with medical students. It's often easier to do it by yourself. They don't always know the lingo or the terms to use. But it was so worth it when I discovered the enjoyment of being able to pay back some of the help that I had received and to help someone else start their career. Now, this plant, this plant here uh, is to remind me of something that I actually learned from Alan Crandall, um, which is to never miss an opportunity to teach, but was reinforced to me by one of my mentees. Now, my mentee was an ophthalmic assistant that gave me this plant many, many years ago when it was tiny, maybe four inches tall. And she had married young, had a child, came to work for the Spokane Eye Clinic when her child was in middle school. Uh, of course, we all teach our staff. Why not? It helps us. The more your staff know, the more they can help you. But this young woman was, um, she was like a sponge. She absorbed everything. She asked questions. She wanted to know more. And then at some point, she went back to school while working full time and got a college degree. 
And then I had the pleasure of writing a letter of uh, recommendation for her to optometry school. And she is now a practicing optometrist. And so every week when I water this plant, which apparently likes living in Utah, I smile and I remember her and I remember to never miss an opportunity to teach. Now we all have informal mentors. And uh, for me, that was women in ophthalmology. This was a group started in the early nineties. Uh, there weren't very many women in the department. And we had a department member who was coming with some, in some challenging circumstances. So I went to Julia Kleinschmidt, who many of you know, who's in the front row in this picture and who started this patient support program at Moran and who kept women in ophthalmology going. Really, she was the backbone throughout the years. And we discussed what would be the best way to support this, this person. And we decided to start having some evening dinners to offer support to her. The irony of all this is that I gained so much more support than I ever gave. And I learned so much from these women about juggling motherhood and career and just life in general. It was an illustration to me of the need to find people or organizations for mutual support in our challenging lives. And I know that women in ophthalmology has been a COVID casualty, but I'm really thrilled to hear that, that it um, may be starting back up again. Now, I'd also like to tell you about another informal mentor of mine, Marlene Moster. Now, many of you have heard of Marlene. She's an outstanding educator, uh, particularly in glaucoma. But the most important thing I ever learned from Marlene was at a uh, Women in Glaucoma luncheon. And what she was talking about was getting help. And I really, really wish I had heard this talk many years earlier in my career. One of the things that used to absolutely take me down was when I would get home from work and find out that one of my children had a birthday party the next day and that we didn't have a birthday gift. Uh, and if we did have a gift, we didn't have wrapping paper. And so somebody would have to go out and deal with that problem. So what Marlene talked about was all the things that she had done to make her life easier. She hired a barber to come to her house every six to eight weeks to cut the whole family's hair. She had a house cleaner. She had someone buy her groceries and put them away. She had yard care and she had someone to buy the birthday gifts and wrap them. So this advice is not just for those who have dual career families with children. It's really for anyone that has a passion in life that they wanna make time for. Uh, Decide what is really important for you to spend your time on and then delegate the rest. And then of course, there's Alan Crandall. Um, so you all know uh, as much about his accomplishments as I do, excuse me. Um, a lot has been said in the last year or so to honor him. And so I won't repeat that now. I do want to tell you about the special lessons I learned from him. So I can remember the very first day in clinic with him. It was my first day of residency. And I walked into clinic and introduced myself. And he said, of course, I know who you are and invited me over to the slit lamp. and asked me what I could see and what did I think about that white fluffy stuff on the lens. And uh, when I walked out of the room, I thought, well, this is going to be fun. And Alan taught me that your life's work can and should be fun. He was an incredible teacher of surgery. Um, you know, I, I am a naturally somewhat timid person. I'm usually pretty sure that there's somebody else in the room who could do a better job at whatever it was than I could. But he just never let me get away with that. He always pushed me to take on more challenging cases until I came to believe that I too could handle them. He was another person who was really unstinting in my career promotion. 
Uh, everybody knows that Alan got invited to all the A-list parties uh, and he would drag me around and introduce me to everybody that he knew, which was pretty much everybody. He included me in courses and labs that he was teaching. And um, he was really, really instrumental in me getting to know a lot of people in the field. Another thing that was important that I learned from him was to treat every human being with respect. And Alan really treated uh, everybody from the, the biggest donor to the newest staff member exactly the same. And then, as I mentioned previously, never miss an opportunity to teach. And he also taught me the joy of giving back. Uh, you can see in this photo that everybody is smiling. Now, Alan's passion was third world um, international outreach. And although I do thank him for inviting me into this world, uh, there are so many ways to give back in our communities, countless ways of giving back. It does not have to be third world medicine, but I was so thrilled that he did include me in this world. And this is probably how I will remember Alan best. Uh, this is in Guatemala. He's got two tables set up, ready to go, one microscope ready to swing between the two tables. And he's the first person in the room sitting there, dark ground, and wondering where the patients are. And then in the second picture, still after all of these years, teaching me to do the hard cases. In this case, it was a Mayan woman with a small eye, rock hard cataract, and pseudo exfoliation and a microscope that didn't seem to focus very well. So I'd also like to thank my other mentors in third world medicine, Susan McDonald and Roger Furlong. I continue to learn a lot from them um, about international outreach all the time. And a special thanks to, to Susan for involving me and inviting me to become part of i -Core. In this picture, I've included some of my most recent mentees in Tanzania, some of the residents that were working with us back in January of 2020, just pre-COVID. And they, um, they reminded me of the absolute joy of teaching those who are anxious to learn. It was really such an incredible experience and so much fun. I included this picture of a gonio lens because this is something else that I learned from them. Um, we were talking about treating glaucoma in Africa, discussing the possibility of various MIGS procedures. And at some point during the conversation, it became clear to me that none of them had gonio lenses. In fact, none of their attendings had gonio lenses. And it was kind of a jaw dropping moment for me to realize that here we were talking about doing angle surgery with people that never even looked in the angle. So they taught me to be so grateful for the amazing access to instruments, to technology, to all that we have and that I personally have a tendency to sometimes take for granted. So I'd like to just re-emphasize the lessons that I learned from some of my mentors and mentees. Provide ample time for discussion to promote intellectual curiosity. If a mentor is not fulfilling your educational goals, by all means, find another who more fully fits your needs. Reach out to potential mentors. It's truly an honor to be asked. And don't be afraid to ask for what you need in the relationship. Welcome mentees into your greater family and if appropriate, your, uh, your personal family and create a great team and respect them. Take every opportunity to promote your mentee's career. Hopefully they will pay it forward. Never miss an opportunity to teach, teach treat every human being with equal respect. Instill courage in your mentees. Finding a way to give back brings joy to all involved. Look for groups that offer mutual support and don't forget help to don't forget to get help and to delegate. And so I'd like to just finish with this quote. It's from Dr. Landine. Uh, it's it from a head and neck surgery uh, journal. And it's really a eulogy to, um, to one of her mentors. 
There are those who go beyond, go above and beyond. They teach us not only how to be good physicians, but also how to be good people. They share their humanity and teach us how to create moments of joy. I know that my career and truly my life will be shaped by the legacy that my attending has left behind. Every interaction a mentor has with a trainee, however minute, is meaningful. What may seem trivial to you may indeed be monumental to us, your giants. And so I wish you luck in finding great mentors and silver linings in whatever situation you find yourself in. If you are truly lucky, maybe one of them may end up being one of the best friends of your life. And so I'd like to uh, thank all my mentors. I'd like to thank you, the faculty, and my friends at Moran for this really incredible honor. Uh, thank you to Randy Olson for all the opportunities and support you gave me over the years. Thank you to Elaine Peterson for your help and answering all my emails so promptly. And a special thank you to my family, uh, my parents, my very first mentors, who believed in me and supported me in my education. My son, Sean, who is a Naval aviator who is currently deployed. Thank you for trying to keep us all safe. Uh, to my daughter, Claire, who is a PhD conservation biologist. Thank you for all you do to save our animals and our planet. I could not be more proud of either of them. And then of course, last but not least, my husband, John, uh, without his love and support for 40 years, none of these experiences would have been possible. Thank you all so much. <clears throat> Jane, that was uh, absolutely wonderful and uh, reinforces the notion that uh, made a good choice for alumnus of the year and uh, that we should continue training residents and fellows um, and uh, we're awfully glad to have you back in the area Thank um, you. it's a good thing are there questions for Jane just just a whole lot of comments in the chat Jane make sure you see them yeah okay. go see the com the comments are, are good and uh, uh, that was absolutely uh, what we needed. Um, this is great. Now, we're at a point uh, where uh, uh, we're going to break uh, for lunch for about 30 minutes. Uh, there are some thank yous, though, that I want to make sure we get out. And I want to make sure everyone knows that you need to come back after you grab something to eat, because uh, our residents are going to tell us all about their quality improvement projects. And I think they have some very exciting things to share. Uh, now, as far as thanks, uh, Elaine, uh, Peterson, Ethan Peterson for the operational aspects of today. Uh, it looks like Monica and I are sort of in charge, but in actuality, uh, Elaine did almost all of the work behind the scenes. Um, Ethan is the one who made it so that we could pull off this uh, technical miracle uh, and would have pulled off what would have happened in the auditorium if it were live. Um, I also want to thank my co moderator, Monica. Fleckenstein, um, it's been great working with her and she's been a huge addition to the team. We have a bunch of research mentors uh, that the residents have leaned on who have given them advice. And among those folks are Brian Stagg, Barb Wurotsko, uh, uh, Stefan Schmitz-Valkenberg, Monica Fleckenstein, Rachel Simpson, Nick Mamlis, Jeff Petty, among uh, others. And if I failed to mention you, uh, my apologies, but that was the list I came up with thinking through this. I, I think that uh, compared to where we were in the past, um, the presentations today that we heard were perfectly wonderful, well-organized. Um, and uh, uh, I think that the uh, uh, mentorship that our residents have been given has uh, been absolutely outstanding. Uh -huh.